Welcome back to the live stream. This week we've got Linwood Taheed with us. We're going to talk about all things economics, including the complex dynamics of education. Be kind, stay safe, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the live stream. It is finally November 2023. We are rolling along. I believe our first show was last year on November 5th. So we're we're one day away from the official anniversary of the show. Um, So that's interesting. Maybe we'll plan a big party. Uh, We got Lynn Taheed on with us today. We're going to talk about all things economics. Guess what? He does system dynamics. You guys know I love system dynamics, so that's going to be a great fit. We've got Mike in the house. We've got Dan in the house. And of course, we've got Professor Steve Keen. I'll bring on the man, Daniel Sanderson. First, here he is. (laughs) Dan, how are you doing, buddy? I'm doing exceptionally well today. Exceptionally well. How's your week been progressing? Really good. I had uh, uh, I had a real, I think a breakthrough. We'll call it a philosophical breakthrough on method. And uh, I'm really excited. It's, um, it's kind of like uh, a discovery and any, all the academics in the, in the room would understand that when something breaks through and you're excited about the work that must now come forth. So I'm, I'm really excited about that with philosophical method. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that sounds interesting. What, what do I think about when I think about method? For some reason, I think about axioms in the Austrian econ school for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, actually, I, I think that um, every great philosopher uh, introduces a new method to the general public and it's partially that method that buttresses the 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 knowledge and and i think that um swimming in this in this milieu of of uh i guess like philosophical canon if you're going to try and make a contribution one of the things that philosophers try and do is make a method that's that's unique so for example plato's dialogues is quite different than the geometrical form of spinoza right so it's this kind of thing spinoza what's that is that a person yeah Barack spinoza <laughs> oh, okay yeah. okay sorry i'm it's, it's not a- uh, it's not it's not my area of expertise ph- philosophy so sorry i did not know who spinoza is hello to everybody in the chat we've got wwe fan we've got the minstrel 55 the hasty int is here i haven't seen you in a while glad you're back michael de souza cruz is in the house i think i saw lana's kicking around too ghost on the half shell Everybody, join the chat, ask questions, have your own conversation, have fun. I'm going to bring on Mike Radzicki. Here he is. Hi, everybody. Hi, gents. How you doing, Mike? Doing well. Good to see you guys. I'm uh, every time I see Dan in front of what's at the Acropolis there. uh, I'm hoping he comes on wearing like a toga. I guess that's a Roman thing, but, you know, whatever (laughs) Socrates would wear. That'd be cool. Just saying, I've got, throw that I've got out bare, there. I've got bare feet. Oh, okay. <laughs> First step, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Anything going on at WPI this week? Or are you guys kind of on a short break? Oh, uh, because... yeah. We just started the term. We're, we're trying to get a few PhD dissertations wrapped up by uh, the end of the term. So that's December. Uh, you know, just situation normal. But, uh, educating young people's minds and all that stuff that we do. <laughs> mm, 
Educating young people's minds. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a positive thing. When you're a professor at an institution, that is what you should be doing. Glad, glad you're doing that's that. That's why they pay us the, the giant salaries. Yeah. Oh, oh <laughs> big salaries. Geez, maybe I should have thought about a career in education. Yeah, well, no, you, that's that's called sarcasm. Uh, oh, 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 oh! I don't know. You look like you, you look like you got a pretty big basement there, so you might be doing okay. Doing okay, yeah. We're we're above the poverty line. That's for darn sure. But you know, it's it's not like industry. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're okay. in bonuses. <laughs> Well, let's ask Steve the same question about, um, you oh, know, the monetary. Go. Yeah. Here we, <laughs> here go. we go. Here <laughs> he is. Oh, Professor. Yeah, when, whenever I, I get caught up in a, you know, argument on climate change on Twitter, and somebody says, "Oh, you're all in it for the grant," think, "What a fucking idiot! Has no bloody idea." Anybody who is in academia for the grant is trying to have a fast route to suicide, uh, whether that's by you know, self-inflicted or, or dying of starvation. So. Um, academic life is not well remunerated it used to be i remember when i was a, um, a, a like an undergraduate student <clears throat> global warming yes uh when i was a a uh, undergraduate student you expect that a professor to live in the most expensive suburb in sydney and quite a few of them did that was called that was called war clues back in those days now you're lucky to live in the, one of the poorer suburbs of sydney because the pay rate has not because there were a whole lot of periods where you, you conceded pay rises for uh, uh, superannuation like your 401k uh, to keep the costs down for everybody. We got a better deal out of that, I must say, in terms of superannuation. Uh, but the wages are shit. My wife, who was a uh, then wife, who was a middle manager in a telecommunications company, earned more than I did as an associate professor, which is the second, the second highest rank uh, as a straight academic at the university. So the pay is lousy. And uh, the conditions used to be good and they're lousy now too. So I, um, as I said, that's why I tell my students, if you want to do a PhD, learn how to make coffee as well, become a barista and do your research in your part-time after you've done your nine to five work and you'll be do much less work, mean much less stress and have more energy than an academic is going to have. Well, there you have it. Straight from the lips of oh. Professor Steve Keen. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe to Prof. Steve Keen. If you're on X, make sure you hit the like button there. Um, repost it. That's what they call it now. And then come over oh. here. Join the chat right here. We like seeing you chat. Steve, before I bring Lynn on, I'm going to get you to do the list. Top chatters, top commenters from last week. Here it is. Okay, I've got to move the private chat out of the way first of all. Ah, oh, Lana hates the uh, dinner. Lana Dill hates the clock. Top chatter. Good to see you, Joe Polito. Another person I chat with regularly on my online courses as well as here. Michael the Sousa Cruz, Web Briggs, uh, we, we were fan go 104, Phil Waller, TR, Ghost on the Half Shell, Stephen Hidden, another regular on my courses. Mason Kerr, Regional 2000, Rich Blacklock. That's a new one. Nicholas Gomez, Manaharan. The Herald of Change. I think we need you at the moment. Economics <laughs> in one lesson. We spar a bit on Twitter. Alex Plante, another one of my courses. Douglas Stowell, JD. Wayne McMillan, JBay088. George Williams, Dave Collins. Poopin' Doopin'. <laughs> well, <laughs> going to discuss your hygiene later. Uh, <laughs> Thomas Darlington, Jens Runberg, Jeremiah Ham, Greg I. Political Economy 101. Are you there twice? I oh, know, okay. And somebody else I spar with occasionally on Twitter. Ilhan <laughs> Dugas, Joseph McMahon, Algorithm, uh, Bass B, The Minstrel 55, Duncan McCown, Tony Wilson, Danger Zone, Dylan Gray, Apple Scab. We should have a talk about commercial arrangements. Uh, Brad Atherton, Murphy, Andrew Sullivan, Christopher Dobby, hi Chris, another regular, D. Smith, Derek McDaniel, Jay Scott, and Rob. And Rob is another one you spar with in the YouTube Oh, that's Rob. Yes. I, uh, okay. I, I, He's trying I to prove to me why a double entry bookkeeping is a, is a mistake, which is mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Yes, I, I enjoyed your, your little back and forth with him oh. and stayed out of it. 
Yodel lady, yodel lady. He's like, hey, he's an Austrian and yodels at my... And, and what he's basically <laughs> telling me is double entry bookkeeping is a fraud. Uh, yeah. Good, Proof is good the fraud t- using it, then I might believe you. Anyway, so, yeah. All right, let's 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 bring on Lynn. Here he is, the man. He's with us. Hey, Lynn Wood. Hello, everyone. Yeah, welcome in. Boy, first time I've ever been cheered into a podcast, so uh, <laughs> this, is, this is different. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's big time. You've reached the big time on Steve. Yes, Friends. yes, absolutely. It's it's wonderful to be here. It's, it's good to be a friend of Steve. Which was the conference we met at? Was it one of the Kansas City conferences? It was, it was one of the Kansas City conferences. It, it was over 10 years ago. But I don't know more exactly. than 10, mate. More than 10. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think more, it's close to 20. Okay. Close to 2002, 20. maybe. More. Well, it couldn't be. It couldn't be uh, that because um, uh, I, I presented some dissertation work, and I, I didn't didn't finish that till two thousand five. So it was after that. Okay. It might not have been okay. long after that. We used to have um, regular uh, post Keynesian and institutionalist conferences, heterodoxy kind of conferences out yeah. in the city. Yeah, when we had, when we had some money, we we don't have yeah. any money right now, so we can't. We haven't done yeah. that for. Yeah, and so, I, was, I mean, I was very, as I said, I was very impressed with your model, and we can talk about it a bit today. Uh, so it's really showing the subtlety of system dynamics and how, you know, the, the range of issues you can apply to is much further than most people think. Yes, absolutely. It is. Uh, it's not a universal tool. There's no such thing, but it has wide range. It does. Hmm. Yeah. So, Lynn, give the audience um, a chance if they don't know who you are. Mm-hmm. How did you get into economics? Uh, what was your progression through it? Maybe going through the universities. How did you meet Mike? How did you meet Steve? A little bit more on that. Kind of tell us about that. Well, I, I came into the economics in um, in 1996. Uh, was it? Yeah, 1996. Um, when I, uh, I'm, I live in Kansas City, I, I decided to come back to school to study economics. I had graduated from UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City, in 84 with a oh. bachelor's degree in computer science. And I spent uh, uh, 20 years in, in computer science, including the uh, last 11 years I owned my own software development company here oh. in Kansas City. And uh, during that time, uh, being in business, I was uh, a a member and president of the Black Chamber of Commerce here in Kansas City. And I was on the Business and Economic Development Committee. I got interested in economic development and decided to come back to school to study economics. Now, fortunately, I I came to UMKC as opposed to other. Yeah, I I just I knew nothing about heterodox economics. I just happened to, to, to live here in a place where the, the department was a heterodox school. And uh, I, I, uh, I was interested in economic development, but you know, I'd had some life experiences and so forth. I wasn't, a, you know, just out of high school into college. And um, I, 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 when I, well, 96, I, I came to school uh, and uh, did some prereqs to get into the doctoral program. I had to take a econ uh, introdu- introductory macro and introductory micro, and I I didn't you know the the macro didn't didn't impress me, but it wasn't anything that I, I felt was problematic. But uh, at the time, we did have some some mainstream economists, one of whom taught introductory micro, and he was talking about theory of the firm, and talking about how 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 firms set prices. And since I had had 11 years business experience, my 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 response was this is this is bullshit. <laughs> but, but 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 I I knew that you know now what I didn't know was that what I did with my prices was what business people do: administered prices or market pricing. Exactly. I knew nothing about that, I didn't know the term, but I knew that's what I did, and I didn't do mm. marginal cost pricing. But I persisted. I didn't, I didn't drop out, I persisted. And then I, uh, in that um, uh, fall of 96, I, I got into Jim Sturgeon's institutional econ class. And I said, okay, this is what I need to know. And, and I mm-hmm. stayed, okay. And uh, so, so that's how I got into, into economics. Um, I, I began teaching at uh, a community college here. In fact, I'm, I'm at that community college today, this office I was in a conference earlier this morning, and one of my colleagues here let me use her office. So I'm in her office 
so I didn't have to go far. And um, at community college here, and then um, I was teaching here, and then I got, got an appointment at, at UMKC after I finished my doctorate there. And I've been there. This is my 20th year at UMKC, so that's how I got wow. into, to, into academia. That's, I have that's, a question. Yeah, yeah. Go, you go, go stand. Yeah, sure. So I, I have a question. We were talking off air that you're an institutionalist economist, right. and right. I had never heard that before. I never okay. heard that. So is 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 Steve and Mike and Steve and Mike or are you all institutionalists? That's what I'm curious about. Well, well, I know Mike is, is a post Keynesian institutionalist, and I would say that maybe I'm a, I, I'm also a post Keynesian institutionalist. I I I. I I, I'm a monetary mon uh, MMT person, right? Uh, and I know Steve uh -huh. is as well, and, and 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 Mike. So so we carry those things uh, from from post Keynesianism, but but institutionalism is uh, uh, an older tradition, if you will. Yeah. In econ. It's what we would call, and and it should be called in evolutionary econ, but somebody else has has taken that name, unfortunately. But uh, but um, you know we we believe that economies evolve. And economic knowledge should evolve, also. <laughs> you know what a, you what a, you know what a yeah. what an insight that uh, this is not Adam Smith's economy, so we shouldn't be use, analyzing it in the same way that Smith would analyze his mercantilism of the of the time. And yeah. uh, so, you know, we, we, institutions are are important in understanding how economies work, uh, because as Wesley Mitchell said, institutions standardize behavior. Right. So you don't have to think about the behavior of uh, in the U.S. You know uh, what, uh, 330 million individuals, because uh, we don't we don't in many cases we don't act as 330 million individuals. Everybody who goes into a bank goes into a bank for certain things, uh, deposits, withdrawals, sometimes to rob it, you know. But uh, but uh, but you know you, you don't go into a bank in order you know 10 pounds of so on stake. So, so behaviors are are patterned in institutions, but institutions change over time, and, and econo economic um, theorizing and knowledge about those institutions should change over time as well. Uh, Steve, Mike, what about? Uh, please comment about how relevant that that label of institutional economist is for for each of you. Go ahead, uh, Steve first. Well, it, it's something as Linwood said. It's a older way of naming non-orthodox economics because if you look at the neoclassicals they evolved out of the work of uh, uh, Augustine Cournot and uh, and uh, Jean-Baptiste Say with his utilitarian and, and Jeremy Bentham that's if you mm. want to find where neoclassical economics really began it's back with those people and then what they built was a, a, a vision of capitalism as utility maximizing system yeah. mm. now and I, I love the fact that you had all that experience in business, and I want to talk a lot more about that yeah, as we yeah. go through today. But that that is a totally abstract vision of what capitalism is about. You have individuals, you have goods, you have firms, and it's all about working out a nice little equilibrium balance between a lot of them. Everybody who has any feet in the real world ends up in something else, and that means you see you know, the institutions matter. So if you go back to what's called the German historical school. Uh, which argued that it's, you have to look at the history and evolution in that sense, even that's before the word was even around, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the institutions shape behavior, and we have a range of institutions interacting with each other, and so on. So that became institutional economics. But it, once the evolution you know, came with, with Darwin's work, then people started calling themselves evolutionary economists, again, to distinguish themselves from this abstract uh, vision of a utility maximizing system. Uh, Marxian was a, was a rival group as well. But you see, if you want to find a, a sensible progression, it's basically institutional, uh, or the historical school, institutional economics, evolutionary economics. And now, of course, uh, long after that came along, system dynamics was developed as a technology. That was until the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. uh, that, that that was developed. So there are all these different strands. And the one thing we have in common is we can't stand neoclassical economics. We have a similar attitude towards Austrian, by the way, Rob. Um, not quite as dismissive as we are of neoclassical, but the, all these all these things are saying, look, you've got to look at the structure. The structure of the economy largely determines the behaviour of the people in it, as well as the economy itself. And the institution was one of the very first versions of that. That's really interesting, you know. And I, I would imagine that you can look at at at, at different geographical or national 
structures of of economic systems and do comparisons to get empirical exactly data yeah, and all, right yeah and then and that's exactly what institutional economists do so for example one of the most influential books i read when i was an undergraduate was called was uh, called uh, capitalism modern capitalism by a guy called andrew schoenfeld and those who want to take it down s-h-o-n-f-e-l-d and what he went through is talking about the different characteristics of national capitalisms so for example one defining difference between American capitalism and German capitalism is the German companies, I think, almost required by law to have what they call the Aufschrat. I think that's the term for it, which is a parallel board to the corporate board. And the corporate board, of course, was looking after the corporation's interests. But the Aufschrat was a separate board that had representation from the unions, the customers mm -hmm. and the local region. And mm -hmm. so what you had was German companies think more because they're required to by the structure. That's where the institutions come in. They think more about the behavior. Of the, 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 they go beyond the interests of shareholders alone. With mm -hmm. American capitalism, all about shareholders. Offer Schrat. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Much appreciated. Well, um, and, if, and then if we go back to, to, to Anne's thing yesterday or last week, Anne Pettifor, yeah, who was yeah. the guest, mm -hmm. she had said, you know, something was just completely alien or inaccurate about economics when she was viewing it through the lens of South Africa. And yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. That's Linwood's experience as well, coming from business. I mean, in some ways, if you wanted to make economics a decent discipline, you'd require people to have 20 years experience in the real world before they go and do it. And I think after 20, right. 20 years of that rule, there'd be no more neoclassical economists. Mm -hmm. Mike, your, your feelings. Oh, yeah. I would. I always would say to your point, uh, uh, Steve, wouldn't it be interesting if we only granted tenure to economists who actually improved a real economic system? Or you couldn't yeah. get tenure. How many would have tenure? <laughs> Twelve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> count them on on two hands. Yeah, I agree yeah. absolutely, hundred percent with what Lynn said and what Steve said. So I got into all this, um, uh, but when I was a graduate student, um, we had a professor in our second year. He came in, a guy by the name of Chuck Wilbur, and uh, first thing out of his mouth was, "How do you know if an explanation for something is true?" And I said, "Well, that's pretty good." pretty good question. Well, he, he went on to teach us it was kind of economic methodology, philosophy of science, and we learned there are different schools of thought in economics. I, as an undergraduate, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sort of the one side of the ledger was uh, the deductive logic folks, the neoclassicals. You start with the laws of the universe, the laws of the economic universe. You start with the mind, you start with logic, and you, you derive a testable hypothesis that you then get, go out to the real world and look at some numbers and see if you can statistically validate uh, the, um, the theoretical model. You know, it kind of comes from physics. Where the heterodox economists, we learn, go the other way. They use inductive logic. They're detectives at a crime scene or physicians trying to diagnose the disease. There's, there's a problem here and they're looking for clues and they use a systems approach. They put the clues together, link them together into a coherent holistic explanation. If they find generalities, those are real typologies. And if they find generalities in the real types, those are the fundamental principles of economics. The most important of which we were told was circular and cumulative causation from Gunnar Myrdal. Wow. So I then start studying system dynamics kind of by chance. And I'm reading Forster and he's saying the exact same thing. You know, you, you use a systems approach. You, the system evolves, as Lynn said, so there's dynamics. The real typologies are generic structures and the most important principles of system dynamics are stocks and flows and feedback loops. So I said, wow, the, 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 the brand of economics that fits system dynamics like a glove and vice versa is, um, is institutional economics. And the post-Keynesians kind of hung around with the institutionalists. They had their kind of toes in each, each mm -hmm. uh, swimming pool but more recently, the um, as we all know, the post-Keynesians have adopted uh, stock flow consistent modeling. Again, that's right in harmony with system dynamic. So, so you know, we um, when you find, I'll conclude with this. Jay Forrester, the founder of System Dynamics, until I started talking to him, thought that economists hate system dynamics, and he was battling with the, from the limits to growth and all that. And I said to him, not all economists will hate it. you got to talk to the right economists. They're in different schools of thought. Well, he was an electrical engineer. He had no idea. 
And when I started saying, look, you got to talk to the right folks, he, you know, we started getting a lot more traction amongst uh, economists. Wow, that's great. I, I, I have to applaud you, Mike, and maybe we can have the, uh, the sound effects come in. That was a great analogy of the deductive versus inductive. Of, oh, that was that's, really, that's from a teacher, Chuck Wilbur. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, let me give you a funny anecdote before I pass it over to Len, because I'm wanting to actually get into what, what Steve was talking about, about real business um, uh, practical in world experience and how you apply that into, into economics. Um, it's Len, right? I can, it's Linwood, but everybody's oh, yeah. calling Len, you Len, Len, right? Len. Okay. Len. Yep. So Len, you mentioned earlier in the show, you said that there's, there's certain words like evolutionary economics that are kind of already taken. And, uh, I kind of thought to myself of a, a funny example from EO Wilson that he said that he wanted to form a group of naturalists. <laughs> but we all know the naturalists are nudist the nudist, nudist colonies yeah. so it's like something like uh Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative like it's it, it, it's it, it like it, it overreaches and takes too much like you can never say something like categor categorical imperative or or naturalist to include something it's like already taken right it's a funny thing with language uh there but Anyways, um, Len, let's put you front front and center here on the stage, and I'd like you to tell me um, a little bit about your experience. Bring us up to speed about your experience as a owner of a, a software development company. Sure, sure. And now I, I mentioned that uh, when I took my uh, my intermediate micro class. I was struck by the uh, unrealism of, of the, uh, the the firm pricing situation. Now, uh, I, like I said, I didn't know what I did was what institutionalists called administered pricing or what uh, post Keynesians called market pricing. But 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 the, the term administered pricing goes back to two institutionalists, Gardner Means and Adolph Burrow, who actually did something uh, amazing as economists. Uh, to figure out how uh, businesses set prices, they actually went out and asked business people, how do you set your prices? And here's an example. Uh, when I was in business, a um, significant part of, of, of the work I did was a kind of cost plus government work. I was, uh, my company was uh, the administrator for the uh, FAA um, uh, um, uh, uh, applications, uh, um, um, uh, applications office here in Kansas City. And so um, um, uh, we were, uh, you know, I had on a, a contract, long-term contracts that was being renewed. And uh, how I set my prices was I, I, I figured out what my total cost would be in my bid. That goes my total cost. Most of that was, it was uh, labor costs, uh, programmers and analysts and so forth. And then I, I asked myself, you know, I, I wonder if I can get a 20% profit on this. And that's and I put, put mark it up twenty percent, and I sent it over to the contracting officer, and that was uh, beginning of an in, in beginning of the nineties. Now at the end of the nineties, with the Clinton administration, they were cutting down on 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 uh, contract prices, at least for small companies. Raytheon and 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 uh, weapons man, weapons uh, makers could get whatever markup they wanted. But the uh, contracting officer called me and says, you know, we're we're trying to cut down the cost of government. I can only offer you five percent. And of course I said, thank you, uh, because to, to say nothing would have been, I would have had to lay off a significant number of my employees. I didn't have the market power to ask for what I was getting before, uh, so I could only mark it up a, a small amount. Uh, that's what Gardner Means and Adolph Burrow found out uh, about pricing. Uh, in, in, and so my business experience uh, correlated very well with what institutionalists and, and later post-Keynesians have discovered about the economy, and they discovered it by going out in the economy and, and doing that investigation that Mike says we, we start with. We want to know how things work. You go out and you look under the hood. Uh, you don't sit in your in your office and, and work up mathematical models and say this is the way, way the world works and everything else is wrong if it doesn't work this way. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm well, Steve has a question because I, I, I think that's not, not, a, not, not a question, a statement. Uh, Lynn, I've just recently worked out the mathematics of profit maximization for real world firms. It's ludicrously simple. And I want to, if you can actually get me to share my screen, I'll back up the graph. Sorry if people are seeing the equations there. There's a graph as well. 
But right. the world that, that Lynn is talking about, we, we call it institutional and say it's not mathematical. But I realize, mm -hmm. well, we're describing the real world. It's what firms actually do. It should be possible to prove why it's profit maximizing behavior, despite what the neoclassicals say. So mm -hmm. if I can, let's see, can I do a share screen here? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, okay, it's going to be this one. Okay. So what I've taken, and you'll recognize this diagram straight away. I'll bring it up here. I hope it works. Yep. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. That's taking a diagram from Andrews, and you'd know, because you mm -hmm. would have been taught by Fred Lee, you would have interacted with Fred Lee at least, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, right. Okay. So this is, uh, Fred Lee published Andrews' work, and Andrews is somebody who also came from manufacturing, uh, took his wine while they realized that he's being taught nonsense by the neoclassicals. And then he basically said, well, what firms have is a constant average cost. They don't have rising marginal cost. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. Firms right. have you know, continuous, they don't have diminishing marginal productivity, even if they have increasing marginal productivity, but constant is, makes sense. And therefore you have falling average fixed costs, which is a rectangular hyperbola for that reason. And you add that on, you add variable costs, which are constant on average total cost to get the total cost of the firm. And the firm will then set a target price, which is what you were doing with the 20% markup over what you expect to be your sales level. It's a very mm -hmm. different story from for software companies, of course, because there's pretty much no uh, average variable cost. It's right. all fixed cost. Um, but that's what we do. We set a target output level, a target price level. And then what that meant is it's very easy to simply derive what is profit maximizing behavior. And you'll mm -hmm. be able to, you can tell probably looking at that straight away, profit maximizing is to reduce your fixed cost per unit. And that, and that means the more you sell, the more you make. So we all mm -hmm. compete for market share. Mm -hmm. And that, that is sensible behavior. So I've got to write that up and put it into a paper at some point. But the neoclassicals tell us that this is how you profit maximize, assuming rising marginal costs. Only one problem, it doesn't fucking happen in the real world. Yes, and, and uh, you know, when I, when I teach my students about, uh, about downward sloping supply curves, uh, you know, uh, I say, well, you know, the example is simple. Go to Walmart. Uh, the more mm -hmm. socks you buy, the lower the cost of a pair of socks is. That's a downward mm -hmm. sloping supply curve. You, you, you don't you don't study that, but but you can derive it from the from the curves. You just have to take the left side of the curve as as, as opposed to the right side of the curve. You take the downward sloping portion instead of the upward sloping portion. It exists in the real world, and corporations yeah. price their products. This is called volume pricing. You know, a big deal. Yeah. And corporations so, are also, if everybody competes for market share, everybody has more capacity than they need. Nobody reads, no, market saturation doesn't happen pretty much uh, because mm -hmm. firms are all uh, over investing. Everybody, over, you, you ought to expect to get uh, more of the market than you currently got. Therefore, the level of investment is normally greater than market capacity. Mm -hmm. You therefore have more market share. You never reach the point of diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, so it's a nonsense theory to begin with. If you come from the real world, you can see it's bullshit straight away, which is what you did. But so tell us about your firm. What 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 were you developing? What are you programming in? Well, we, we well well we were we were programming before on mainframes. <laughs> wow. Uh, as, okay. as a as a as a programmer, I was a sys was called a systems programmer. I installed yeah. and fixed operating systems when they crashed and so forth. Right. Wow, and, okay. so, and so when I started my firm, um, uh, one of my my first big customers was IBM. Uh, IBM, uh, you know, they sold mainframes, they sold software for IBM. But now and then, they would have problems that their programmers couldn't fix, and so they'd hired me to go and fix those problems. Wow! And okay. and you know, I was very good at it. But I that was as a single person, single person a firm, and I decided that I wanted to do some bigger things. And, and in order to do that, I needed more people. So I, I, I began uh, bringing in application programmers, people who bought, wrote business systems and so forth. And so we, we started to do the systems work. I continued on, but we started to do application programming. Uh, grew to uh, 33 employees at one time. Uh, so we wow. were going quite a bit. Uh, and um, I, I was doing well as, a, as an individual. Uh, but I also, of course, went went back to school to study economics because I was interested in, in community economic development. And I, I realized that I was doing well, but but how does that translate into into helping my community do that? So I closed my business and went wow. back to school. 
I went back to school and 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 studied economics. And uh, out of that experience, you know, I I I I bring some real world experience uh, into the process. And uh, and so I've been doing that community economic development work, and uh, my my work in education is I think part of community economic development. You know, you have to you have to have an educational system that works for you to be be smart yeah. and to make things that are going to earn you earn you an income. So, so it's all it. I I, I mean, it's, I tell my students everything is connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so you know, this is that cumulative, a circular and cumulative causation. Mm -hmm. That, that Mike mentioned in terms of Murdoch, I teach Murdoch, and uh, what happens in one place affects what happens in other places. But it is definitely, uh, if you're going to affect the economy in any place, you have to change the structures that cause yeah. behaviors and cause other kinds of things. So now, you know, my 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 simulation stuff didn't. I didn't start out in systems dynamics when I was in business, but I did do some uh, some what's called capacity planning work, which is discrete. The simulation modeling, right? Okay. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, my 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 degree was in uh, com, uh, uh, computer science and mathematics, so I was you know mathematically oriented to do that. So it didn't scare me. It didn't surprise me that uh, when systems dynamics came along, I like Mike said, yeah, this will be a good tool. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think both Mike and I kind of uh, 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 wrestle with among institutionalists is that institutionalists tend to be aver adverse to quantitative stuff. They, they're, they're adverse to the math, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, qualitative analysis is good, but you can't throw away tools and expect to have the right tool when you need it to, to, to get the job done. So you have to be quantitative and qualitative, and really there's no separation between the two, but that's another, that's another conversation. And so my use of math and Mike's use of math in terms of systems dynamics is uh, Mike. I, I adopt Mike's term institutional dynamics. Yeah. <laughs> we, we want, yeah. We, we want to know what the institutional dynamics of things yeah. are going on. And systems dynamics is a way of modeling that. Your, your, you know, Steve, your, your Minsky program, of course, uh, we, we, we met before Minsky when you were yeah. using VisSim, which, which, mm -hmm. I, I, which was more of a, uh, you know, an electrical engineering, I guess, uh, yep. uh, use of, of the software I use mostly, which is VinSim, uh, yeah. going back to Forrester, but it's all, it's all based in that Forrester, Forrester uh, mil milieu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for, for Forrester is our big daddy, without a doubt. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's an interesting thing, we all have a background in mathematics. Well, I, I, when I went to university, I wanted to do economics and engineering, mm -hmm. and there was no such combination. So I did a law instead. So I did an arts law degree, uh, which meant I do I could do the economics and the mathematics and the arts degree, which is sort of a generic you know pick whatever you like out of all the courses at mm -hmm. the university. And I'm so glad I did that because learning the so-called mathematics by the economist, I was horrified at how simplistic the shit was. Yeah, and uh, you know, same sort of reality. I remember sitting in the lecture theatre. I've mentioned the story a few times, but I was uh, uh, the, they started the quantitative lectures in the second term of a three term system. By this stage, I'd done one full term of pure and applied mathematics. And we had really quite a brilliant teacher of pure mathematics, pain in the ass teaching me applied, which is a great pity. But the guy teaching pure mathematics, calculus now, uh, uh, all the calculus, mainly the algebra, but uh, calculus ideas as well. And he, his idea was you start from first principles. You derive everything. You don't even remember the cosine formula. You know, you, you derive it yourself when you need it in a question. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did all the time. And then I, the first line was written down with the lecture on quantitative methods. And the next line he wrote, I went, there's got to be at least five steps between that and that. I worked out there were seven before he wrote the next line down. Mm -hmm. And on it went. That was the average. So math, they, they were learning their mathematics, skipping seven lines of logic at each point. And I thought you can't possibly understand what you're being taught. So that rigor that we get out of an engineering background to some degree mm -hmm. uh, gives a really strong foundation to make us critical of what neoclassical economists think is really hot shit. It's right. shit, but it ain't hot. Hmm. What Mike. did you program in? I've got to ask. I'm sorry. Well, well, I, I, I I programmed my main main language. Firstly, was a similar language, right? I knew it. I yeah, I, I'm a similar language programmer. Oh, application God. folks that in my in my firm programmed in COBOL, right? Yeah. And, and, oh, and, 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 and there's still COBOL systems around. And uh, yeah. if, if you know that stuff, you can make you can make some money. But yeah, my language was a similar language. I wanted to get down almost 
I was I was in the generation after machine code. And wow, I'm, yeah. I'm glad I came in the generation after machine code because I because that would be too tedious. It would be but I uh, actually am very like just because I got involved in the computer industry. So the way that I learned what I know about computers comes out of computer software. Right. Uh, and, and and the at some point I taught myself some assembler. So I could do a bit of assembler. I taught myself C. I like C. I tried to learn C plus plus and I hated it um, because it's such it, it's got two conflicting philosophies. You've got functional programming tied in with object oriented, which is a real mess. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but that that gives us a huge solid foundation that you know these yeah. these wankers in neoclassical economics have no idea of what computer programming or mathematics yeah. is really about. Yeah, and my first job as a as a programmer outside of you know university was uh, at a at a medical laboratory, and and we programmed on a it was an IBM I forget what it was one of, an old IBM system we programmed in Fortran, but we were doing byte level work in Fortran. Wow, um, you know, so you so you had to you had to you had to learn how to manipulate bits and bytes using Fortran stuff. So, so if you didn't know the assembly code, you, you you wouldn't know how to modify the Fortran, but but um, you know it, it made it quicker. But we weren't we weren't using well we were using Fortran for the mathematical stuff, but we were really using it for the low level programming. Um, I did some COBOL programming, but I I I I, I wasn't I, I didn't really like doing the the application stuff, the business stuff. But I, so I liked the operating system stuff, and so that's that's what I did. And uh, became became quite good at. I really really enjoyed what I was doing, um, and uh, I hated to close my business, but I felt a, a, another calling, uh, and 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 so I did that. But we did um, um, app so software development for for large corporations, and uh, we also did some systems integration where you're putting hardware and software together in, in terms of systems and so forth. So wow. so we we you know I, I really enjoyed it. I was I was quite good at it. And uh, uh, but uh, you know it, I, I came into economics to do something else, and so and so that's what I did. Yeah. It is a calling in that sense, as you say. Hey, Steve, can you can you walk the audience through the the choices that that you and Russell, because um, Russell Standish was really uh, mm -hmm. important for the development of Minsky, right? Your your uh -huh. programming partner. Um, mm -hmm. Can you walk the audience through some of the, the 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 programming language choices and the technology behind? Since we're on oh, that, that topic, of... that that's just one language, C plus plus. Russell okay. is an absolute genius at C plus plus. He he has a PhD in physics, and he is. And we've got to get him on the show at some point. He's in Australia, so of course we'd have to change the time for that particular episode. But uh, Russell uh, wanted to study complex systems, uh, the an evolution of complex systems at university. And there was no degree. He's a he's a few years younger than me. He won't tell me. Well, I know his age, but he's about you know I'm I'm in, I'm 70 now, so he's between 60 and 70. And Russell really wanted to study evolution of complex systems, and uh, there's no way you could do that in any degree choice. So he did a PhD in physics, and then what he built as part of that was a system he calls EcoLab, and you can still find that on SourceForge. <laughs> and EcoLab is a multi-agent, multi infinite dimensional uh, predator prey system fundamentally. So what you can set up is a set of uh, interactions between different elements inside that, whether it's supposed to be animals or whatever else, and it will evolve, evolve in an infinite dimensional space. So it's, and he then, of course, to do all that stuff, you've got to know tensor mathematics and all this sort of jazz. So programming Minsky for him is, is second nature. And mm -hmm. I've seen, I mean, one of my favorite experiences was we had a really hot shot young programmer do my course at the University of Western Sydney into um, uh, manager was I've forgotten what it was called managerial economics or something like that but I turned it into a course in post Keynesian economics and chaos theory and simulation and he built a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis in a in a program running in a DOS window uh, I gave him 11 out of 10 you know it's great work and then he said look I'd like to program Minsky to run on the web with a multi user interface so several people that could be working on the same model at the same time uh, and you're, you're interactively seeing it and he, he built the framework of that but didn't quite finish it when he was doing the, his course with me anyway we had to give him minsky's code for him to see that he's a pretty hot shot kid and he walked out you know cocky 
And he came in the next day and he looked like this. And he said, I said, what's wrong? And he said, I used to think I was a good, a hot shot C++ programmer until I read Russell's code. Mm-hmm. Wow. So Russell is that good, you know. I wish I had, <laughs> had half a dozen of him rather than just one. The hassle was getting enough time out of him. So you can actually find Russell Standish on episode 23. We had him last year. Um, it was a recorded version just because of the time issue. So if, if anybody's interested in, you know, the creator, the coder of the Minsky software, you can find it episode 23. Make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe to the Prof. Steve Keen YouTube channel. If you're on Twitter, hit that like button, repost, and come over here. Join the chat. Dan, you're doing a great job running the show, so I'm just going to... I'm just going to keep letting you do that, and I'm going to sit in the background. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more question. This is maybe a bit of a quiz. Knowing what you know of Minsky, how many lines of C++ do you think it's got? Asking me? Yeah, you and, you and Mike, if you would like to have an idea. 10,000. Oh. No, well, C++, yeah, maybe maybe 100,000. 40,000. 40,000, Okay. You guys averaged almost contact. perfect there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a hot piece of coding to get that much power under 40K of, uh, of coding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. So, guys, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to uh, make a couple remarks uh, about administrative pricing and, and so forth from earlier. Um, my interest in economics or in heterodox economics stem from... Um, just my intuition. I always thought it was weird that economists never would get out from behind their desks and mm-hmm. talk to people and ask them what they what they did. You know, the there was the theoretical stuff, the neoclassical stuff, and then the real world was you would acquire back then a reel to reel tape with numbers on it, and you'd torture the numbers with statistics. But you never went to, like to a bank and talked to bankers and say, "What did you What do you do all day?" <laughs> and they can tell you. Right. And then you build your banking sector or whatever. So I always thought as an undergrad, that was a little, I, you know, as an undergrad, so what did I know? But I just thought that was a little weird that that was almost taboo to even suggest doing that. Like, why, why would you want to do that? Right. Just go, go and take another calculus class or something, you know. So um, I, I mentioned earlier how uh, institutional economists explain things. It's this inductive thing. and It's, it's the same thing as system dynamics. And I, I mentioned the regularities, how you build up to principles from the tech detective work, getting out from behind your desk and finding out what's going on. Mm-hmm. So our uh, we in system dynamics, we have a uh, a real typology or a generic structure for pricing, administrative pricing. And it stems from the work of Syert and March, two Carnegie Mellon uh, professors, who went to a grocery store and said, how do you price all the stuff in your grocery store, right? And uh, from that, they created a model and we've taken it into system dynamics and done it our way, but it's, that's the foundation of it. So basically a price is determined by, well, first of all, what is the historical markup? How do you typically do things around here? Which is quite common in organizations. Oh, here's how we do that around here, right? So that would be, that would be a stock, the historical markup, mm. right? And then you would have your your unit costs, and now we get into the accounting stuff. You know your labor costs and your fixed costs spread over per unit and all that stuff. And then um, you can mark it up with your historical markup to get your price. Except there are pressures coming from elsewhere in the system. Do you have excess inventory, and you want to get rid of it? Well, then you tune the historical um, uh, markup down. To have a bit of a sale. Are you trying to capture market share with price? Not always the greatest idea, but <laughs> you know, if you want, if that's your strategy, what's your competitor's price? And are you sensitive to it? And you can set it up where, you know, we match a competitor's price cut, but we don't match a price rise or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. It depends on the particular industry, the particular situation, and you can set it up. And of course, then as the si- simulation evolves, your historical, this is how we always do it, starts to evolve yeah. based on these other pressures and things. So so we have a paper in the Journal of Economic Issues some years back, I don't remember the exact year, in the 90s sometime or something, where we lay out that structure if anybody's interested. Mm. 
I have uh, <clears throat> I have a bit of a sketch for everybody, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the sketch in, and I want I want you guys to think of Amazon, okay? So <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to think that Amazon is in itself in and of itself an institution, and could be, and I'm maybe leading a little bit here. It's not like it's um it's it's a country, but it man it controls a lot of GDP, right? Okay. Now, the evolution of the way Amazon has grown, gained market share, penetrated new, um, new markets, they're in a very co complex ecosystem of, of product and service delivery, right? So a strategy that has evolved rather recently has been to introduce something like an Amazon Prime so that they're actually trying to compete with the broadcast networks of of Netflix and and you know these these kinds of things like Apple TV and and everything like that. So that's very complex. It's 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 not like I got a widget, I'm trying to sell a widget, here's my profit. The the complexity of of the Amazon market share turns into something that's that's very unique um how would institutional economics look at that just and i mean from a descriptive standpoint land what, what what are your thoughts about amazon is using that as a specific example okay so since since i'm a methodologist i i, I want to make sure that the concepts are understood and well defined and and look the the term the word institution there are 57 varieties of the word institution, maybe even more. Uh, the way I think, and I think the way that institutionalists, original institutions think about institution, Amazon would be a cluster of institutions. We call that an organization. And so, for example, an institution that would be under, uh, one of the institutions within Amazon would be uh, double entry bookkeeping, generally accepted accounting principles. Those are a, a cluster of things that you find in Amazon, you find in other other organizations as well, profit and nonprofit. Uh, you know, Thorsten Veblen talked about an institution as being a settled habit of thought, right? It is it is how people think, and it is settled in the sense that you know we 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 pick this up from from society. Uh, we get indoctrinated into thinking in a certain way, and and I guess if you're you know you want to do your bookkeeping right. You're going to do at least according to the law. You're going to do a certain type of double entry bookkeeping. So Amazon does that, but Amazon also has a predatory way of thinking about the world, uh, which essentially one at least one aspect of it is is if someone else has invented it, we're going to steal it and 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 uh, uh, run them out of business by by making our, our service um, uh, cheaper. Uh, every corporation instead of wanting competition, wants to run their competitors out of business, right? That contrary to what the neoclassicals think. So uh, the idea of predation is there. So there's a settled habit of thought among business people. Let's run my competition out of business. How do I do that, right? So that's part of Amazon. Um, you, you know, that, that, that idea of competition, running your competitors out of business may also exist in, within, within the, 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 the religious systems. You know, we want everyone to convert to one religion as opposed to another, run your competitors out of business. That's another aspect of Amazon. Another aspect of Amazon was, uh, you know, the Amazon has gone from mostly full-time employees to part-time employees. They've done that to increase their profitability so they don't have to make uh, to, to pay um, uh, benefits. Amazon is not the only organization that's done that. Other organizations have done that. So there, there, are, there are institutional, there are settled habits of thought, there are ways of thinking that come together to make Amazon the organization that it is. Uh, some of those things are unique to Amazon. Some of those things are not unique to Amazon. They, they permeate the, the, the structure in general. Uh, and, you know, with, with regard to like double entry bookkeeping, one of the problems with, with economists is that they don't know anything about double entry bookkeeping. They, they, don't, they don't study balance sheets and income statements, yet they want to write up treatises on, on how business people use those things uh, when they know nothing about it. So, so there's that settled habit of thought in economics that says you don't have to know anything about the real world. You can just sit at your blackboard and theorize from first principles. Uh, that's, a, that's an institution. 
and it's an institutional framework that keeps neoclassical economics um, unusable, but it also is, there's a, there's a power system there in terms of those at the top uh, who are making the big bucks at the big universities kind of surveil uh, everyone else and make sure that you can't publish in certain journals unless mm -hmm. you uh, do it by a certain way. That's a settled habit of thought as well. So those things at, that I, I think of institutions, not as the organizations, but as the components that make that particular organization different from another organization. Yeah, Len, you threw a lot out there. And I think part of it, I, I'm going to say part of it was um, ethics. There's some some real ethical concerns and alarm bells that you bring up with uh, the actions of, of, of Amazon and others, right? It's not just pointing right. it at Amazon. My, my question is actually for Steve now. Um, Len brought up this idea of first principles, but he applied it to <clears throat> he applied it to uh, neoclassical economics. And I'm wondering if you could compare and contrast the use of uh, first principles from a neoclassical standpoint versus how you would approach it. Um, because we, you know, you, you brought that up earlier about first principles and maybe even give an example of, of what's an example of a first principle approach to, um, I would say, just to use an example, I would say monetary policy to control inflation, right? Uh, what would, how would you approach that from a, uh, from a, uh, a first principle standpoint and how would a neoclassical vary? Vary. Well, then we we'll just, we'll just mentioned a couple of those issues. Neoclassicals would apply from first principles saying the government borrows money from the public. Uh, are my first principles, let's do the double entry bookkeeping, what actually happens. And you then, double entry bookkeeping is quite a strict uh, discipline. You simply cannot um, define, um, you, know, you, you simply can't say uh, the gov uh, banks lend out reserves. You say, well, okay, uh, that has got to be a minus for the reserves then. And there's got to be a plus somewhere else on the same line to balance it. So where do you put the plus? If you put that plus in the liabilities, you get a violation of the laws of accounting. So it can't be that way. So the plus has got to go in loans. And then it goes the plus in loans. You've only got two entries. You've reduced the reserves. You've increased your loans. But how does it possible to get the money? Well, the only answer is they must have borrowed cash. Okay. You say, well, that doesn't happen. So then you rule that out. So they can't, they can't lend from reserves. That can't be the first principle. The logic like that. Equally, when I work on uh, on the firm, that you know, thing I showed a moment ago, the cost levels of the firm. They say the first principles is uh, you you work out that everybody is. It's an, we, we're not in a static world. This is not a cha unchanging system. Equilibrium is blitter, as Keynes said. So you have an evolutionary system. People are competing for market share. Uh, they all have more capacity than they need. Therefore, they therefore there's no diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, so it, it's all the stuff which actually says, think outside the constraints of a static box. Whereas the neoclassicals began in the static box, mm -hmm. and they're trying to fit everything into it. And as um, my argument has always been that dynamics contains statics and evolution contains dynamics. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to shove all the others into the box, and they simply can't go there. Um, so that's, the, that's been their fundamental mistake. Other first principles I've showed, you can derive Minsky's financial instability hypothesis from three definitions. The wage to share of GDP, the employment rate, and the private debt, debt ratio. And I can derive Minsky from that. So my first, you, you, your first principles, you have, uh, the neoclassical have been searching for first principles under the, under the, the uh, light that they mm -hmm. first shone, which is Marshall's idea of diminishing marginal productivity. And they're never going to find it because that light is outside the park in which we live. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Mike? So just real quick, I did put a uh, a link or a, a citation in in the comments on YouTube and uh, in the uh, uh, streaming platform here. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Rahelio Oliva, uh, John Sturman, and some others, where they did build a system dynamics model of Amazon and fit it to Amazon data and what have you. Certainly, it's not the the only way to do it or the definitive way, but there is a, a model that you know how would a system dynamicist do it. There's at least one example of that. If, if anyone is interested, when you uh, go the neoclassical route, the Descartes route, starting with logic and work your way down to the real world, testable hypotheses, you're looking for laws of the universe, like the law of gravity, while well, you're looking for the law of supply and demand or the law of diminishing marginal productivity and what have you. 
And so by the very nature of when you're doing that, when you're trying to do economics like physics, um, you are trying to get away from all the institutional detail, the detail of time and place. The, the law has to be universal. The same thing is in 1929 as in 1979, right? And uh, the, the, the cultural context and what have you, that no good, that's irrelevant, right? Whereas in system dynamics, institutional economics, it's just the opposite. We're on the ground and we're trying to find out why is whatever happening, happening now, right? And we, we we're not bound by um, uh, things deemed uh, legitimate by the economics profession, but we look wherever, if it's the educational system that's involved, we bring that into the analysis and what have you, right? And then we, you know, uh, either traditionally institutional economists would kind of mentally simulate the evolution or look back in time and say, here's how the uh, shoemaking profession went from, um, uh, you know, a cobbler that learned how to do everything to a mass production uh, type of situation. Whereas we have now the luxury with computers to simulate uh, the structure of the system. All right, Glenn, I'm going to actually try and move the, the conversation forward a little bit. I'd like you to tell the audience what you're working on and uh, what the what the next year has in store for you. What are what's okay. what's the focus here? Well, uh, something I've been working on for oh, um, over 20 years is uh, something I call critical institutionalism, um, which is a kind of a combination of um, original institutionalism and, and critical realism. Um, you know, I was, as a, as a student here at UMKC, I was in, we have an interdisciplinary PhD program. And so my, my, my first discipline, my primary discipline was economics, but my secondary discipline was, was social sciences. And uh, professors in the, in the social science component, one, one of them was a, um, uh, a, a social theorist. And so he, he, he taught us, um, 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 a philosophy of social science, not social theories, he was social philosophers, philosophy of social science. And he was a very well accomplished critical realist, realist uh, in the tradition of Roy Boscar and so forth. And I found now in, original institutionalism has its has foundation, its philosophical foundation in the work of John Dewey. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that comes about because both Thorsten Veblen and John Dewey were, were students of, of Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, the, the developer of, of, of what we call pragmatism. So they come out of that pragmatist uh, line. Uh, when we were doing critical realism here, I found lots of commonality between critical realism and, and, uh, and pragmatism. And so uh, I, I started to think about how I would, I would think about combining those two items together to, to create an idea of how I would model evolutionary change. How do, how do things change? How do institutions change? But institutions are, you have components. And so in, in my work, I have uh, what we would call resource structure, which is something that Marxists are, are interested in, right? The distribution of resources. I, I have a cultural system and its components, which, which is something that original institutionalists are, are very concerned about. There was a mention in the chat about anthropology. Well, you know, one of the first articles that Veblen wrote was, why is economics not an evolutionary science? And he starts out by talking about how anthropology should change the way we do economics. Uh, thing, economic systems are different in different places, and anthropologists know that because they study those things. There is no universal way of doing it anything, particularly distribution of, of the rewards of, of, of resources. But but there's also the psychology. There are people in, in economic systems, you know, you, yeah. and, and while the, uh, the idea of human agency is, is very foundational to psychologists, neoclassicals have an agent in their system, but their agents are idiots. And, and so, you know, if, if you really want to know about, <laughs> if you really want to want to study uh, what agents do, you have to, you know, think about what real psychologists know about agents, not about what Jerry M Bentham said about what, uh, what, what psychology is. So you have to use 21st century psychology instead of 18th century psychology. And so you combine those things together into a, a I think, a way of understanding why, how, and why people do the things they do. 
and I call that critical institutionalism. One of the exercises that I'm doing with my institutional class now is we're going through an institutional analysis of, of buying a house in Missouri, in the state of Missouri. And there are 22 steps. There's a, a there's a website that delineates the 22 steps that you have to go through to actually get a house bought and sold, starting with the offer, ending with the closing and getting the keys. Those 22 steps were not in place 100 years ago. Most of those steps were not there, but they came into place to prevent people from defrauding the system. So, for example, you go through a title search because it's possible for someone to pretend to sell a house that they don't own. And if you're the buyer of that house and you've given up your, your financial resource, some money into that process, then at the end, of the, you, you get the keys, but you find out that it was a stolen house. <laughs> you, you, you've been defrauded. So you put in a closing process where you have an independent intermediary that makes sure the, the seller of the house actually owns the house, but also make sure that the check that the buyer is going to is going to give for the house doesn't doesn't uh, bounce at the bank. You get these 22 steps to make sure that have evolved over a period of time to make sure that house buying can actually go in the way that it should be going. Uh, one of the things that happened in the 2008 crisis is that many of those steps were eliminated out of the house buying process. So you got a lot of fraudulent mortgages. Uh, um, but 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 that's another story. But anyway, that's that system of house buying. Those steps are transactions between various people, buyer and seller and buyer and agent and so forth that have evolved. And my my critical institutionalist model is a way of modeling each of those transactions. Uh, where you have resources, you have the cultural system, the legal system, contract law, uh, other kinds of things, but you also have human agents that have uh, agency, that have intentions, that want to do things. Sometimes, sometimes those things are they want to defraud the, the buyer or the seller in that process. And you have systems that are intended to stop that, uh, that 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 usually work. But but uh, you know, if if you have a crime, an opportunity to commit a crime, somebody's going to figure out a way to get around it. And, and get that, com that crime committed. So, so that's what I'm working on now in terms of methodology. All, all, of, all of that work is connected back to an understanding of community economic development. It's, it's, a, it's a tool to use in community economic development, which is my ultimate research project. How do, I, how do we build communities, uh, wealth in communities, and how do we build um, uh, particularly communities that historically have not uh, have been discriminated against and have not and there's a wealth gap uh, there uh, what do we need to do to to move that process forward so that we can eliminate at least the effects of the discrimination if not the discrimination itself just pardon me just dropping in is there a formal structure to this yes yes uh, there are two papers that are in the journal of economic issues on uh, critical institutionalism, part one and part two, that um, I think is 2008 in the JEI uh, that I, I, uh, I, I work out the logic. This this comes from my dissertation, but it was actually work that I did before I even came back to school uh, when I was, uh, uh, I said, uh, community, doing some community and development stuff um, um, uh, in, in the community before, before I became a, an academic. So it, it ties to that real world experience to try to get an understanding of why, how do you, how would you model uh, these things, including my uh, uh, creating a systems dynamics model of, of a particular situation, you, yeah. you, and 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 one and 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 one of the things that that it became necessary to have a method of modeling for me in education was that there are a, over a hundred different variables or, or factors that that have been researched in terms of why there are differential outcomes in education. I wanted to create a model, but I didn't want to create a model with 100 different variables. <laughs> so I had to figure out what do I leave out of my model? What's not essential in the particular situation that I'm trying to model? And I needed a method to figure out what things to leave in and what things to, to, to keep in. And critical institutionalism was, was what I developed in my dissertation work to help me develop the model that would, would make some sense in a particular situation. No model is good for everything. So as the situation changes, you have to change your model. And the model I did was 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 kindergarten with kindergarten students. Lots of things on yeah. in terms of education are are not applicable to kindergarten students. You know, you don't you don't ask why do kindergarten students not not know calculus? Well, you know, 
it's not applicable or why they can't do physics or, or, or they don't have a chemistry lab. If a school doesn't have a chemistry lab, they still should be able to teach their kindergartners how to read. You know, so you don't put the chemistry lab into your model or, or that higher level of education. You leave out things that are not relevant at that time. And, and so the critical institutionalism as a methodology is helping me to model the evolution of systems. Okay. I want to. I want to hear Mike. Mike. I want to hear Mike's feedback here on what's been said by Lynn. Well, I think um, I like how Lynn is uh, extending the institutionalist paradigm, and he's certainly extending it into a very important area. And I think where the um, well, well, traditionally, what um, not just economists, but what would be done in sort of schools of education would be, people would be running regressions left, right, up and down. And you're trying to figure out on the right-hand side of the equal sign, what are the explanatory variables that would explain some aspect of underperformance in, in educational settings, right? And that's okay. There's, there's nothing, you know, horrific about that per se, but with the tools that we have, the systems approach, these simulation tools, we have the ability to uh, represent soft variables uh, like uh, motivation and uh, prejudice, uh, performance, uh, cooperation, things like that. And the uh, feedback structures that we try to identify can uh, serve to eliminate some of these things or often reinforce these kinds of things. So then the question is, and this I think is an entirely consistent with institutional economics, is how do you change the institutions? How do you redesign the airplane so that the performance improves? Do you need to sever a feedback loop? Do you have to, have to add a governing negative feedback loop to control something? Mm -hmm. This sort of thing, reverse a positive loop in, in the other direction. And we have the ability uh, to do that now. It takes boldness and courage to do these sorts of models, though. It really does. Forrester would always tell us, if you, all, if you guys are going to work on problems, pick important ones. Don't waste your time with the trivial ones, number one. And he always told us, if you do this kind of work, you better have thick skin. You better be have courage. You know, I say you got to have courage. Because when you start to lay all this stuff out, and people say, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Then you hit the go button and the machine mercilessly traces through the implications of what you've laid out. Uh, that can be troubling to some people. And then you start to say, how can we make it do something different? How do we redesign the airplane? And a lot of times we find in system dynamics the following. This is what the I'll give you a corporate example. You go around the corporation and you ask people, what do you do? So you're out, out from behind your desks and people can tell you what they do in the accounting department, the finance department, the shop floor, marketing, sales, all that stuff. They do it every day, all day. They can tell you what they do. Uh, and you can write equations representing that, right? We find in system dynamics, almost invariably at each place in the system, what people are doing is makes perfect sense. It's not crazy. It's not irrational, anything like that. They are well compensated for doing whatever they're doing. Everybody's happy with, yes, they're, this person is doing. But when you hook all that stuff together, you get a terrible holistic <laughs> outcome. So now try to get somebody who's been successful and well compensated from doing X to stop doing X and start doing Y because it'll improve the overall system, right? That, that, that requires leadership. That requires, we think, gaming, get, getting people who didn't build the model to understand the model or where this is coming from. Like, why do you want me to, I've been doing this for 15 years this way and I get a giant bonus at the end of the year. I'm doing this well. Why do you want me to do the opposite or something completely different? I don't get it. They're like, then you get the resistance, right? So it's, it's tricky business and you have to have courage and you have to have leadership in order to make the change. Otherwise, we're just doing academic artwork. <laughs> you know, look at my elegant model here. Let us, you know, praise my brilliance for this mathematical edifice I've built. But if you want to change the real system, mm -hmm. th that's the tricky part. And you got to have, pick the big problems and have courage. Yeah. 
Yeah, you have to be able to change those settled habits of thought. <laughs> those habits have to change. You betcha. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not about replacing the people and having them do the same thing that old people did. It's going to end up the same result. You have to change what people do, which means you have to change how they think about what they're doing. That's right. Oh, look, I've, I've had a couple of interesting examples on that front. I work with a guy who was doing selling cycles in commercial property in Perth in Western Australia. And what he found was these quite severe cycles, boom and bust cycles. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to do a model of it. I've forgotten why I did the model. And I think I did it in difference equations and MathCAD a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. And what I showed was the time lags uh, actually generated the cycles. And right. the best way to reduce the cycles was to increase the time lag, slow down how fast you approve something. And what that meant was you didn't you didn't react as rapidly to small changes in the system so you stabilized the commercial cycle you weren't so quite, quite, yeah you went you, you, counterintuitive if you want to cut the cycles out uh, a neoclassical thing get to equilibrium rapidly uh if you, if you model it dynamically slow it down hmm. interesting and I'm muted, Ty, we're gonna oh, sorry i'm i'm muted um sorry i apologize <laughs> if, if, you know, if anybody's got <laughs> uh I'm mediocre today i've had some bad ones lynn um anybody has some questions in the chat make sure you put at lynn or whatever and i can tag those and bookmark them and we can actually address them on the show um, I know I'm sitting with a bunch of academics right now, but there are stupid questions. So if they're stupid questions, I'm not going to put them up on the screen. So make sure they're they're relatively intelligible questions. Lynn, I have to get you to do the top chatter, top commenter list from last week. It, it, it requires you reading a bunch of names that are extremely hard to read. Okay. Um, I, I think at this point, I'll let Dan give you the inspirational speech on how you should deliver it, and then we'll let you go ahead with it. Okay. Dan? All right, Lynn. The, the only words of wisdom that I can offer you are to commit wholeheartedly to the names. So it's like whatever pops up first, just, just embrace it and go quick but do it with confidence my friend do it now with that, confidence. That, that's the opposite of what steve advised this company was to slow down <laughs> yeah. uh, not, not, not to run headlong into chaos but i'll you know we'll, we'll see how it works <laughs> okay all right we we will go from a third order leg just down to a first order leg so here it is top chatters commenters from last week go ahead lynn okay lana del uh, uh well, it has, to, has I test the clock? Joe Polito, Michael De Souza Cruz, uh, Web Creeks, W W E fan ten percent, Phil Waller, T R, Ghost on the Half Shell, Stephen Hinton, Mason Kerr, Regional Two Thousand, Rich Black Blacklock, Nicholas Gomez, uh, Horan, Mano Horan, Mano Horan. Uh, the Herald of Change Economics is in one lesson. Alex Plant, Douglas Dowell, JD, Wayne McMillan, uh, J Bay 088, George Williams, Dave Collins, Poopin Dupin, okay. <laughs> uh, Thomas Darlington, Jens uh, Runberg, Jeremiah Hamm, Dag, uh, Drag, Dreye. Uh, Political Economy 101, I know that one. Uh, Ilhan Dugas, uh, Joseph McMahon, Algorithm, uh, Bass B, uh, The Minstrel 55, Duncan McCowan, Tony Wilson, Danger Zone, Dylan Gray, uh, Apple Scrab, hmm. Brad Atherton, uh, Murphy, Andrew Sullivan, Christopher Duby, D. Smith, Derek McMillan, Jack uh, Desat and Rob or Rob. Hey, I, I didn't get to go All right. Every every week the list is longer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, we are going yeah. to get 
uh, we're going to get to a point where I'm going to have to adjust that strategy and maybe just pick the best chatters instead of all of them as we grow. Um, but we'll see how that goes. That's a good problem to have for the show, right? More and more. Better, so. Yeah. 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 Um, then, then can you just tell me, pardon me diving in, try to follow up. Are you right. doing a lot of work with system dynamics modeling these days as well? The, these uh, days? You're using ISIM, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I am. Um, I, I've got some, I, you know, I usually start out, start out uh, with, with uh, well, as an intermediate, what's called causal loop modeling, right? Right. Uh, yeah. And 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 I do I create my causal loop models from from what what uh, systems dynamics is called uh, uh, public elicitation. You, you hold meetings. You you go out to a group. You ask them um, um, uh, things about about their life, uh, about the problems they're having, and so forth. And you get try to get down into the details of what they're doing. Mike has, has said this. You create a causal loop model, and then the next step is to figure out what the stocks and flows are in that model because you want to you want to create a systems dynamics model. So I'm doing a lot of elicitation work now uh, in my in my community development work. I, I actually have a, a process that came out of the critical institutionalism that we, we hold what we call forums. Uh, the first is a current state forum. Then we do a visioning forum, and then we do a a, a, a was it uh, resources or uh, vision into action type of situation? We do strategic planning. Um, a lot of that work comes from, um, um, uh, gee, slipped my mind, the, um, um, oh, the, um, mm, Mike, Mike would know, help me out, Mike. It's the, um, the, um, the visioning type of stuff, the, the group uh, shared vision. Conceptualization. Uh, yeah, well, the, the shared 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 visioning type stuff was the uh, the author of that uh, systems dynamicist, a uh, student of Forrester, but uh, he's he's done his he's come. You mean group sorry, group model building or conceptualization? Yeah, or yeah, group model building and that kind of stuff. There's an author well, out Jack, there. Jack Venix does a lot of that, and yeah. uh, the Albany uh, guys, George Richardson, David Anderson. Uh, yeah, there's a. There's yeah. a group at I think it's Washington University at St. Louis that has a community based yes, system dynamics yes, project yes. where they yeah. are developing techniques for going into the community and yeah. accurately capturing what people yeah. Yeah. know about their yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what kind of my modeling process. Go in the community, um, uh, have forums, listen to people, um, and uh, try to put those into, into causal loop models, and then try to to to, to create simulation systems. Because uh, you know, a, a lot of the things that happen in that world it becomes counterintuitive. Uh, that term was used. People think that things are happening because of things that are not causing them. Uh, and, and, and one of the differences, the uses of systems dynamics modeling, it is a causal process. You're, 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 you're modeling what causes what instead of just econometrics, which is just correlational, right? Yeah, correlation is not causation, but we're actually trying to get to causation of things. And, you know, every model is wrong, as Sturman, Sturman, Sturman uh, says, uh, but uh, some models are better than others. And uh, so, so that's that's the work. I mean, uh, right now, most of my focus is on community economic development. And how do I use these tools, the critical institutionalism, to develop uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the process of eliminate uh, of, of elicitation, and uh, how we go through our forums and so forth to create a model that you now bring that back to community and say, hey, this problem is being caused by this. And then you have to get them to accept it and want to change, which is so. Hard so if I, if I could leap in here, so think about that. What Lynn is doing, and I'm assuming you're teaching your students how to do it, or at least pointing yeah. them that direction. How many econ students are taught to get out from behind your desk and get out in the field and find out what the hell is going on? No, uh, in, in our in our in our program, lots of them, right? Yeah, well, in your yeah, program, but I mean that's yeah. a header. Oh, in general, no, no, no. Econ, yeah. You know, uh, look. Uh, econ students, students in standard programs, uh, they, they use data. They use data created by others. They don't create their own data. And then they never look at the data. They simply run through, you know, some, some uh, whiz-bang regression program without looking at the distribution of the data, without thinking about the data generating function, without even figuring out whether the data is truthful or not. And what I mean is 
because you do a survey with someone and you ask them a question doesn't mean that they give you the, a truthful answer. And some of the answers in some of the data sets that I use are contradictory. Mm -hmm. And, and you have to figure out, well, that person, who, the people who gave this answer, for example, one of the data sets that I used in, is called the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. It's a, it's a study that started in 1998. I used the kindergarten section of that. And they asked uh, teachers, you know, what level of expectation do you have for your students? Almost all the teachers say we have high expectations, some very high expectations. You look at the performance of their students, they're not uh, responding to high expectations because teachers have been taught that's the way you answer that question. I mean, what teacher is going to answer, I have low expectations for my students. <laughs> right. right. So they're lying. And so you have to go into the, the data and, and, and see if you can find something that will actually give you an indication of their expectations as opposed to what they say. Uh, economists never interrogate the data or the data generating process that way. They simply use the data, they never look at it. So if I may, just to follow up on that, thanks for that, Lynn. So uh, one of the things we've encountered here at my university is we send student teams all over the place, like to 65 different project centers around the world, and they have seven weeks to complete a, a, a project. It's a, they work in teams. It's worth the equivalent of three courses for each student. So it's a major degree requirement. And of course, because of some of my work, I guess, and what have you, uh, I get asked all the time, ooh, can we use system dynamics for our project? And I said, well, have you at least taken one class in it here? And it's usually one person in the team has taken one class. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know that's enough for you to go abroad uh, and uh, spend seven weeks and build a really good, insightful model. But what you can do, here's here's my comment, uh, and, and I'll get your, your feedback, Lynn, is um, I've suggested that why don't you go and gather data by doing what you do, talking to the folks where, where you're at, and then when you come back, we'll build a model. Mm -hmm. But they need an orderly way to, to gather that data. You can't just go, hey, what do you do? You know, it's, it's got to be some kind of scientific process. So what I've been doing is trying to modify Greg Hayden's social fabric matrix. He's an institutional economist, and he, he takes a systems approach but he doesn't do formal dynamic system dynamics modeling or anything like that. But it's a way to identify kind of cause and effect, kind of a causal loop diagram sort of template, but it gives the kids some framework that they can use to ask people questions to gather information for a model. And I don't know, Lynn, are you using any such tools or have you developed any tools or any favorites or? Yeah, yeah. The, the the critical institutionalist portion is is a way of asking tools. For example, when I when I talk about resource structure, um, which is you know the distribution of resources, uh, we 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 have a cat we have seven categories of resources: natural resources, financial, uh, political, uh, uh, cultural, social, so forth. Uh, we we use those terms in a little different way sometimes than than you know are standard to use. But but we want to ask the, the community members about the resources that they have available. When you get when you get uh, distressed communities, financially distressed communities together, you start talking about resources. The first thing they say is, "We don't have any money." Okay, well, let's put that last, because there may be other resources that we have that we can take advantage of to eventually get the money that we need to do other things. Uh, you know, uh, James Brown had a had a saying: "You have to use what you got to get what you want." So let's figure out what we got now. In, in the community development framework, that's called asset-based modeling. We want to know what the assets are. We change the term to resources instead of assets because we don't want people thinking too much in an economics <laughs> way of thinking about, I have to exploit this thing. Uh, but but, but we, have, we have a structured process there where we uh, create a resource, uh, a resource database for the community for the current situation. Then we do some uh, some analysis as professionals to, to work out the institutional structure. When we go into visioning, we 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 don't ask community members. Well, we do ask members. You know, what would you like your community to look like? But if you ask that question, like, just like, what do you want your community to look like? They, they say, we want the trash picked up. So we had to modify that into what what do you want the community to look like for your children and your grandchildren? 
because if you still have trash problems 25 years from now, you haven't done anything in, in the interim. So we, we extend mm -hmm. the vision. This 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 work is Peter Singe is is the, is the person that I was thinking of, who yeah. uh, who who in the fifth vision. We kind of use that as a as a framework for doing these kind of of certainly visioning sessions. And then we do a, a strategic planning process where we employ some of John Commons' ways of thinking about complementary and limiting factors in terms of, you know, you want to do something, what do you have, what do you need, what do you need to do to get the things you need. And so there's a structured process for community development that comes out of this that goes from elicitation to analysis to action and, and planning and so forth. So planning. thank you for that, Lynn. And guess what? I'm assigning your papers starting tomorrow. So yeah, uh yeah. Okay, <laughs> and, and I and the framework for this I, I call the community economist work plan. And I can Excellent. I can get you some I've done some writing on that as well. Oh yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Anything you want to send me or whatever, that'd be great. Uh, and I'll get the kids doing it. Yeah. 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 Did you Sony's say Peter did you say Peter Singer, like the philosopher? Peter Singer. S E N G E. Oh, okay. Okay. He wrote so a book called The Fifth Discipline in mm -hmm. 1991. And it's kind of it was kind of a management bestseller, but he took a lot of system dynamics stuff smeared it together with other management and psychology stuff and it became like a big management bestseller yeah hmm. so we have a question from michael de souza cruz here um bring it up lynn have you anything on the job guarantee program through your work have you delved into that any i've, I've none done nothing myself on job guarantee program i do have a, a dissertation student who is uh, doing a mm, an analysis of job guarantee programs uh, and the effect of automation that that automation uh, would have on job guarantee programs. He's using an MMT framework. He's uh, um, mostly interested in the idea of what's called human human emancipation. So that would be the only work that I've done anywhere near job guarantee program uh, work. But but you know, UMKC became has has become famous for it's work on job guarantee programs. We have lots of students who've written dissertations. I've just not, I've been on committees, but I've not done, done any work on myself. Yeah. Right. So we've got another question here from Tony Wilson. He asks it every week. So I'm just going to give it to Steve because he's asked three of us. Here it is. Um, how do you guys model permutations? The real world has permutations like storms, terrorists, and other things. Steve, do you want to address that first? Well, I'm going to bat it back at you, mate, because, I mean, I, the, the problem that I think we all face in working in economics, it's such a primitive discipline that what we really have to do is build foundations that should have been there 50 or 100 years ago. And that's why by bringing in system dynamics and, and uh, uh, other concepts of that nature, we're saying this is what you should be using. General equilibrium, perfect competition, oh, for Christ's sake, get back. And so I've wasted a huge amount of my life. And I, 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 I've lost numerous brain cells by trying to educate neoclassical economics or by trying to tell other people don't be fooled by them. So I would love to remember bringing that sort of stuff in, but I haven't done it. Now, one somebody who has done that uh, is a, a bloke with a tie in this uh, presentation here, who did because, yes, that's right, you tie, because the um, Minsky does the not tie. yet, tie. yeah, Minsky doesn't yet have stochastic elements to it. I could bring in like a, a Poisson's distribution or a Gaussian distribution toolkit. We haven't done that yet. Just it's we're getting the deterministic modeling right first. So that meant that it would be very hard to model something stochastic or with perturbations. And this little bloke down here used not one but two um, Lorenz cycle models with different rates of sampling to generate a pseudo random number generator inside Minsky. So tell us about that type. Um, uh, okay, I can, t I can tell you about it. So like you said, Minsky doesn't have any stochastic features. Um, so I had built a pandemic model. Now, the, the hard and fast rule in it in system dynamics, and Mike, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but we don't want to include the noise we want to see the general structure of the system uh, um, just to get you know basic insights from it but i wanted to create a simulation that a politician or a policymaker could um uh, make so i i needed days in this pandemic model 
when infections were were lower than the day before, but it didn't necessarily mean we we're cresting the curve. Um, and so I wanted some stochastic feature. I have always loved the Lorenz model. I love also the double pendulum model, just the dynamics of it. You got to be a real big geek like me um, to like looking at a graph and uh, I'm not even talking the double pendulum where you actually see the two pendulums. I just like looking at the spirals on the graph and the numbers myself, but that's another story. So anyways, I decided actually it's three Lorenz systems I employed in this um, model. One was for deaths because death, deaths are random. No, You can have a percent of people that are likely to die when they get ventilated. But ultimately, there is a randomness to it. I had randomness for the infection rate and one other variable. Um, and really, my goal was not to add noise, but to have a simulation where there are random events that happen, just like economic shocks, that may change your, your policy decisions on a given day. And if you respond to those stochastic effects... Um, prematurely or you're not responding to them, that has an effect on the system moving forward. So that was my, my reasoning behind it. Now, a few years ago when I took that model to a lot of system dynamic groups, I was, of course, criticized for it because I was introducing noise in the model. But I think, um, I think that's something that you should present to a policymaker because that's something they're going to encounter in the real world um so that's why i added it and i just i love adding cool math shit like that thanks for putting me on the spot steve you're welcome Matt. uh yeah it's it is something which we need to include like tony's talking about in designs of, of, of plans you'll have a, a set of eddies will happen that change the dynamics you'll have a, a wind gust coming in from the, you'll go through an air pocket etc cetera, etc cetera. And that means you've got to have those random elements as part of what you uh, try to control. We would love to be including the stuff you're talking about, Tony. The thing is, economics is so primitive, they're not even at the stage of having causal models. And that's what we're trying to bring is the causal side, first of all. So it's an enormous frustration to me that I have to give you a sort of fob off answer. But that's how bad economics is. And and so right, right now, right now, sorry, I'll let you go ahead, Lynn. Yes, sure, I, I am. I am kind of this has kind of been the last area in my kind of engineering um, venture is exploring um, proportional integral derivative controls. Um, so right now I'm I'm on the, the MATLAB uh, website kind of really homing that in because I want um, to have proper parameter adjustments for my large, large economic model. Um, that's not going to actually cause um, an integration error. And right now my model has a lot of if then or else statements and I've had to really optimize my, my parameters to make that model run. If I go ahead and do, let's say a lever change, let's say an interest rate change uh, by the central bank, there are points in the, uh, the different business cycles where it actually causes my model to crash. So yeah, I'm I'm myself and personally kind of doing that in my last little venture of learning the system. Lynn, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, there were there were two uh, components of that question that I think uh, maybe can can bring a different point of view as well. Uh, there was two perturbations, right? Uh, storms and terrorism. Well, yeah, well, meteorologists study storms. They don't think that they are uh, necessarily surprise events. They, they are caused. They're things that are caused. So if you have a if you have a model that is going to model something that and you want to include storms in it, you might want to hook that into the meteorological forecast systems, right? And one of the things that also sh should should happen is that um, you understand that if storms are getting more frequent and and more severe. That's not accidental either. There's a systematic process going on here. You want those, you want that in your model. Now, what mm -hmm. economists, except someone here, is going to put the tie the weather system into their economic model? Certainly, Nordhaus didn't do that. That's a shout out to, to Steve. You know, he didn't mm -hmm. do that. The other thing is terrorism. Uh, one of uh, Mike's colleagues, Khalid Saeed at WPI, has has done models in terms of 
causes of, of political d disturbance, including things like terrorism. Uh, if that model makes sense, if it if it's tracking things, you might want to include that in your in your economic model if you're doing an economic model, so that those things don't become just uh, stochastic events. Some things are stochastic. We have uncertainty about them, I mean, ontological uncertainty, but but some things are being modeled by other by other uh, people that you might want to include in your model. That would make economics uh, more sophisticated. Uh, but but uh, just economics as an as an isolated. Uh, way of, of thinking about the world doesn't really do well in thinking about the world. Chinese, so Chinese have a little common follow through here. Um, you think things like car suspension, aircraft design, you have to design it for perturbations. So that's exactly the same thing for the economy. You have to design it so uh, like investment boom will take place and not cause slumps on the other side. Of course they do. Now the trouble is we're still fighting with economists to believe the system heads towards equilibrium. and. Uh, and, and that, as you said earlier, you were amazed how primitive these guys are. They are. I mean, if you want realism, you've got to get hold of people like myself, Mike, Lynn, Ty, who come from a non-neoclassical framework. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're dealing with people who are actually asking you, how many angels are dancing on the head of that pin? They're really about that bad. So we're, we're trying to get to the stage where you can say, how can you design this economic system to be like a car that won't be disturbed by a pothole? But at the moment, they're, they're saying, oh, let's assume potholes don't exist. Or let's assume the car can float across the pit at infinite speed above potholes so it won't notice it. Mm. Ludicrous stuff. And then they are actually damaging not just you know engineering projects, but the survival of capitalism itself. That's why we're, we're trying to build an alternative before they destroy what we currently have. Hey, Steve, so let me, let me just jump in here. So how, the, how system dynamicists would answer the question is as follows. So first of all, we routinely uh, add noise to our models. And of course, there's different kinds of probability distributions. And it depends on what you're uh, trying to accomplish with the noise. And uh, you got to be careful with your integration method that you use because you can turn white noise into pink noise uh, inadvertently. So there's a whole, a whole area of how to, how to do that. So when would we uh, add noise? Uh, well, generally speaking, uh, after you got this the deterministic stuff under control, you probably want to perturb the, the system with noise appropriately done. And we would add noise uh, when we're not uh, places at which there's an important uh, influence, but we're not explicitly modeling it. So we might be modeling uh, the uh, demand for a product rel by relative price, relative uh, perceived quality, relative delivery delay, whatever, and then idiosyncratic other things. Uh, YouTube influencers, well, we're not explicitly modeling it, so we'll jiggle the, that, uh, the, the, the deterministic part with, with some noise. And when you do that, um, if you don't have a, um, a uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the term, it's, I'm, I'm drawing a blank now, uh, 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 a, a number that starts the random sequence um, a seed. the same a way seed. every time. A seed, a seed. A seed, a seed value, a that's seed. what I was thinking of. Yeah, I yeah. draw a blank. A seed value, then every time you run it, you'll get a slightly different uh, outcome. You know, the, the, broadly speaking, it'll be the same, but it'll be a little bit different and much more realistic looking. Um, now, if you want to... You know, if you have something as, as Lou was saying, like terrorism or something, you say that could perturb the well, then, and that's important. You might want to explicitly model it or take some what somebody else has done and include it. So that's a bit of a different thing. As long as you can precisely define the shock, the perturbation, instead of just saying, well, we're not explicitly modeling it, you explicitly model it. But as, uh, as uh, both Lynn and Steve were saying, absolutely positively correctly. From the system dynamics perspective, anyway, the reason we build these models is not to forecast some number in the future, but to help us redesign the system, to help us redesign our institutions so that they behave better, right? So we, we're not trying to predict when the next perturbation is happening or the next shock. We're trying to design the airplane or redesign the airplane so when it's shocked from the outside, whenever the shocks come uh, and from wherever they come, the plane still flies well. Uh, Forrester used to tell me, um, think about um, boats floating on the ocean, and each boat is a firm. 
and the ocean is the economy and the, the economy, the ocean is going up and down. And he said, you can't, as the captain of your little boat, your company, you can't change the ocean, but you can design your boat. So it's bobbing on the surface as the ocean is going up and down while your competitors are, are listing and sinking and, and whatever, because you got a better design boat. And that's what we're trying to use these tools for. So we've got a question here for another one from Tony. It is, do you remember which stock market crash happened when the models got shocked by an event perturbed? And I think it was in the late 80s or early 90s. Steve, I believe you have something ready to go here. It wasn't a shock. It wasn't a perturbation. It was part of the system that neoclassical economists ignore, which is the role of private debt and credit and courting booms and busts. And that's been my major initial contribution to economics to model that. And so what I argued, and this is based on Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, it was his vision and, and Fisher's that I try to put in a mathematical form. We have private credit is a major part of aggregate demand and income. It's a huge part of demand for stock markets. Uh, assets and there'll be what you got during the 80s the 87 crash you're thinking about was an enormous boom uh in in the australian case i think the stock market rose by 80 percent uh between january the first and october 29 or whatever it was when the market finally crashed by 20 percent in one day and uh when you look at that um uh you know i'll just actually show the data uh what you have is a well, what was ignored by the neoclassicals is this causal factor. So you've had an increasing level of private debt over time. That's the top chart there, going from 50% of GDP right after the Second World War to 170% at its peak. And then you have the, the crash, which is shown down the bottom. This is the, the crash of the, this is the 2007 crash. So you went from credit being 15% of GDP to minus five. But if you go back to when the crash occurred that I'm talking about, the... Um, the, the stock market crashed back in 87, you had a declining credit event there as well. Not as severe, didn't, didn't from not as high a boom, to not as low as a slump, but that's what the major trigger that caused that financial uh, crisis back in 87. So that's where it comes back to the causal issue. Mainstream economic leaves out enormously important causal factors in, um, in the real world. We're trying to bring them in. At the moment, that's more important than random events. Mm. Was the eighty seven was that long term capital management? Was that the trigger? The, the oh, that was in the nineties. That was the nineties. Yeah, um, there was a stock market bubble. I mean, I actually had the great pleasure of giving my first presentation for my master's thesis the day after the stock market crash in eighty seven. Mm -hmm. And I it was before the internet, but there was some I've forgotten what Lynn, you probably know. There was another system that existed before the internet, sort of a like a dial up modem system um where you could get access it was actually run in the was background it, behind television screens yeah. mm, I, I i i think i know i don't remember the name of that system yeah but there it was a lot but yeah yeah it was it was a parallel feed done on television signals to mm -hmm. transmit data and then if you had the right software or approach you could actually access that so i managed to download the stock market data for 80 87 and show the bubble that had occurred in the 87 stock market boom and then mm -hmm. similar Australia was actually worse. Uh, and uh, well, Lich, as I said, an 80% rise in the market in 10 months. Now that's just, it was, and it all, it, a lot of this stuff is debt finance as well, margin debt. I'm actually working on that right now for the book I'm writing. Um, so all this stuff is, is non-mainstream because they say debt doesn't matter. Okay, where we are, sorry, it's mainstream says that. We're non-mainstream saying private debt matters, credit matters, the financial institutions matter and they're left out of neoclassical economics completely. So what do we do? We're fighting all this stuff. We prove it. We have the data, overwhelmingly positive, and they get the fucking Nobel Prize for bloody Ben Bernanke. Uh, Steve, uh, there's there's that run up on personal debt going on right now mm. that uh, at least uh, there are various politicians are saying, look how well the economy is doing. People are spending money. <laughs> uh, where they're, they're using their credit cards. And so you know, that's not I, I think actually that's where I've got to concede to Warren at the moment, Warren Mosler, because uh, the scale of deficit spending in America is still quite high. Apparently, I haven't checked it carefully, but apparently it's running at about 8% of GDP. And that's such a high level of, of, of fiat money creation, which itself also adds to aggregate demand, that that's under overwhelming 
any negative side from the credit's point of view. But credit still seems to be quite positive as well. And like Ghost on the Half Soul says, isn't credit fundamental to economics? Yes! <laughs> but you try telling a neoclassical economist that, you'll say, you suffer from money illusion. Bad boy, we're going to fail you. Why don't you I'm go still, to sociology? I, I'm, I'm still a little bit leery on the thesis of aggregate demand from interest income on treasuries. Uh, depending on where the treasuries yeah. are, if they're if it, now in the states, it's not it's 30, 25 percent foreign owned. A uh, huge part is in the financial sector. So how much are they spending on consumption uh, versus a household? Um, and a, another big part is the Federal Reserve is buying these treasuries. So the and, interest and payments are going to the Fed and then back to the Treasury. So I'm a leery on the, the I'm leery on that side of Warren's argument but for another reason as well, because as interest rates go up, you devalue existing bonds. Well, so Ty, I, Ty, I, I, have a, I have, a paper, I have yeah? a paper that I wrote that is a, um, a, a book chapter with Randy Ray. Uh, that looks at um, these um, uh, counterintuitive effects of of, uh, of bond holdings when bond interest rates goes up high, how that in fact a adds to aggregate demand. It's a systems dynamics model. I'll, I'll share that with you. <laughs> Send it to me. Yeah. 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 it written there? Is that in this sim? A Ben sim? Uh, it's in it's in uh, Power Sim. Power I got power. power I got Power Sim. So you send that to me. Can I, can I, I get you know. to play with Minsky a bit, mate? Can I? Fiddle to just try a bit of fiddling with Minsky. I really yeah. appreciate your feedback. Yes, I, yes, I can, I can definitely, I can definitely do that. Really? Yeah. So, so how much um, should economists or heterodox economists consider joining forces to some degree with psychologists or behavioral decision theorists? So, you know, because you get into irrational exuberance and herd behavior and these sorts of of things that we can absolutely model. And, you know, sort of in the, you know, can it happen again realm, uh, it seems to be a bunch of psychological factors that are quite important. I have an answer. I'm, I'm not, I'm a bit with Lynn, and if, 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 pardon me if I distort you, mate, but you said earlier that people aren't, in, in, don't behave like in, in, individuals so much as elements of an institution. And it, what you get out of this, we have a huge amount of herd behavior. It isn't individual psychology, it's herd behavior. And that's when I model Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. I simply have, you know, in ca capitalists invest more as the rate of profit goes up. Workers get better wages as the employment rate goes up, et cetera, et cetera. And that alone is enough. So I, I, don't, I think we're, we really don't need to worry about the individual level of behavior for quite some time. What we do need to worry about is feedback, again, uh, amongst people that generates herd behavior. Yeah, the, the quintessential uh, group of individualists are adolescents. Uh, they want to go their yeah. own way, and they all dress the same. You know, so so it's, you know you, you can't get away from we're, we're social animals, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the herd, the herd matters, so we're actually modeling the herd fundamentally. Yeah, I like uh, Lynn's earlier point about asking somebody in the community about something and then he used the example of garbage but then taking it one step further and saying okay let's project that out for a period of five years what would you like to see it and i think at aggregate it's going to um it's it's going to be there's going to be a lot of similarities in the system like you say but it's it's worthwhile and it'd be it'd be worthwhile to see how um uh like political systems or changes or realities of economic systems actually change the five-year trajectories of where they would like to see some some sort of outcome that would be i would say where uh wh where you would um i guess bring in the psychology well i think and, i think five years is not is not far enough i we, we put it out yeah. 20 25 years because we're wanting them to think about their children you know, as five years is, is probably not long enough for someone to, to not think about their problems, but think about the future generation. Gen generational time frame. Yeah, I, I, I get I get that, Lynn. But I think the, the issue is that I would say keep that as well as the five year. I think one of the problems that happens on the left is that it's so focused on multi generational that they yeah. forget that there's that, you know, some high percentage of every American or citizen is is living on a paycheck to paycheck sort of situation and so from a psycho from a psychology standpoint mm -hmm. 
how do you capture this um, uh, uh, agent based trying to make change from within yourself, right? So I'm going to set um, I'm going to set a five year plan to be able to achieve something, right? And then you're you're kind of hitting those generational just uh, like demographics. Like if if I'm in my um, you know I'm I'm approaching fifty, but then it'll change at fifty five. It'll change at sixty. It'll change you know, as we, as we kind of go through a system. So I would urge you to say capture multiple, multiple. So like the five year and then the generational, but don't do just the generational in a vacuum. Yeah. Well, let me, let me be clear. The, the visioning is set out generationally, but, but the planning is you have to plan to do something today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day to get to that, that, uh, you know, that generational change. So you can't just wish for something to happen 25 years and do nothing now. You have to do it now. And I think even in your planning, five years is too long because you're going to find like, you know, you, you let a plane on a, on, a, on a thousand mile journey and you have a plan that's going and you look at 250 miles, uh, a thousand mile journey, 250 miles later, you look to see if you're on course. You're probably not on course. So you need to do course correction more frequently <laughs> then, 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 you know, every five years. And, and I also, I've also have, has a paper in the JEI on this in terms of uh, what I called uh, uh, the uh, deliberation, talk, talk about Dewey's process of deliberation, where you, you, you make a plan, but you also need to, to check where you are in that plan frequently, because your plan is going to be wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, need, you need to make course corrections more frequently than that. So the, the 25 years is for visioning. It's, it's, it's singly calls dynamic tension, right? You have a tension that's drawing you towards something psychically and you, and you make your, your, that's your strategy. Your tactics are to do things every day to move yourself in that direction, including making course corrections uh, uh, if you're not on, on track. Can you get a so reminded me of Rocky Horror all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> so we got, I, I, uh, what, we got one more yeah. question here from Tony. We're at actually getting close to two hours, but we'll finish it off with value. I know Steve wants to answer this question. Um, I've been very looking quick. at the very basic yeah. fundamentals of value. Like, what is value? Economists seemed obsessed with monetizing everything, but not all value is monetized, Steve. In fact, they put it in very abstract terms. They talk about utility and individual utility, and, and they try to sum it. And of course, they fail to sum it, but they don't tell themselves or their students that they've failed to do the aggregation. Uh, it, Sandy, this is not directly what you're looking at, but I've written a, my original master's thesis was on Marx and his theory of value, and it explains ultimately you've got to have an objective foundation to your theory of value. And if you search for McKean Marx thesis, you should be able to find that on the web. If you go to my Substack page uh, or my Patreon, which, which are open access, you don't have to don't have to pay. You can, I'd like you to, but you don't have to. And you can access it there. You'll find my thesis on value. Uh, Lynn, Lynn, can you add anything onto the uh, value question there by Tony? Uh, from an institution's point of view, Clarence Ayers in a book called Theory of Economic Progress writes, economics is nothing if not a science of value. But but you you have to figure out what value really is, um, uh, you know. When when I came into the PAC program, uh, like kind of like Steve, I wanted to do a cro uh, discipline uh, co discipline in uh, industrial engineering, because I was in, interested in how industrial engineers uh, define value, and and they define it as adherence to specifications. So if you just want to go, uh, you know, travel um, down the street, you don't need a Maserati. A, a, a Kia will do fine. If you want to, if you want to profile, if you want to show off, then you probably need a Ma Maserati. So, so the value depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, it's not a subjective thing. It's actually uh, something that you can measure. Value engineering is a component of of industrial engineering. They know how to do it. Economists don't. Very nice. Very, very nice. Well, we're, we're at the end of the two hours. Um, I got to mute Steve. You're giving a little feedback there. Steve is muted, but he's still here. Tony, uh, we gave you all the questions this week. You've been asking them for four months now. So we got to you, buddy. But the main thing is I'd like to thank Lynn for joining us on a Saturday. 
uh, oh, it, two it's hours been, of uh, it's been two hours of your time. Pleasure. It's Thank been a you. pleasure, absolute pleasure. In, in, invite me back. <laughs> you are welcome. You, yes. You're definitely, you're definitely in the rotation. You're you're a, a wonderful person just to talk to. Um, I kind of stayed out of it this week because, well, I've got four very very smart people. I just decided to sit back and listen. So thank you. Let's get the cheers from the couch. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have Lynn back. Oh, no, Steve wants to say, I'll unmute you, Steve. You're I'm back. Say, looking at Tony, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an Aussie, four o'clock in the morning. My God, mate, oh. that's dedication. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, okay. there you go. Wow, Tony. okay. Tony, yeah. that is that is yeah, truly that's, that's amazing. Okay, yeah. Yeah. What, Can we put Tony on a art car? Put Tony at the top of the chatters list, maybe next week. Be... Next week, he's going to be at the top of the chatters yeah. list. Next next time, Steve's back in Australia. Is going to take him out to yeah, lunch. Catch up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye, Anyways, all. see you next week. Bye bye.